Jennifer, uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, a wonderful event today, uh, and we're here to welcome uh, Carol Hardy Fanta. Uh, and this is uh, in celebration of the Gender Studies program here at St. Anselm College, uh, which uh, five years ago, uh, there was a certificate program in Gender Studies that was approved, uh, which was the product of uh, some hard work by uh, a member of the English department, uh, Anne Holbrook, and Beth Salerno from History, uh, as well as some others. And uh, it really uh, grew um, as a minor uh, over time, uh, as well as, especially um, thanks to uh, Elaine Rizzo from Criminal Justice. Uh, and now, uh, Professor Jennifer Thorne uh, is the, the head of the Gender Studies program here, and she's doing a fantastic job. Um, Today, male and female students majoring in natural science, history, psychology, philosophy, politics, Spanish, English communication are all pursuing this minor. Uh, on the occasion of the fifth anniversary of the minor in, this year, uh, we're welcoming two speakers uh, to come to, uh, to visit campus this month. Uh, and we hope that the work of these speakers demonstrates the way the range of ways that gender studies can be pursued and its intersectionality with an interest in other tools for analysis of social organization, representation, and identity. So one of those speakers is here today. Uh, Carol Hardy Fanta's work is widely recognized uh, in political science and in other disciplines as outstanding work uncovering and analyzing the intersection of race, gender, and ethnicity. Uh, as well in, in politics and in public policy. Uh, I actually read her seminal book, uh, Latina Politics, Latino Politics, uh, when I was in graduate school, and it really uh, actually pushed me towards uh, studying women in politics. So I'm so excited that she's here. Uh, she has published several books since, uh, and her latest book is Contested Transformation, Race, Gender, and Political Leadership in 21st America. Uh, and she has co-authored this with some of the leading scholars in Latino politics, intersectionality, uh, Asian American politics. Um, uh, aside from that, uh, she's uh, the former director of the Women in Politics uh, and Gender Leadership and Public Policy program at UMass Boston, uh, and as well as the former director of the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy there. Uh, so we are so thrilled to have her with us, and so I'm happy to introduce Carol Hardy Fanta. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate the nice introduction. And I also want to thank Jennifer Thorne and the Institute of Politics for inviting me to be part of this um, Bean Distinguished Lecture Series and to mark the fifth anniversary of the Gender Pol Studies minor here at St. Anselm. I also want to thank my daughter, Caroline, to help me out here today. I'm having a little mobility issues. Uh, makes you very sensitive to other people's issues at this point, so thank you for helping me out too. And I want to thank the faculty, students, and others from at St. Anselm and elsewhere who have come today. Thank you for coming. It's a great honor to be here. My talk this afternoon draws heavily from several chapters on the book Jennifer mentioned. And there'll be a book signing afterwards if anybody is interested. Um, today I'm going to address some questions such as, one, how do race and gender shape political ambition and the decision to run for elected office? Two, what can we learn about why women and men of color run for office the very first time? Three, in what ways do they report having received different kinds of scrutiny and different kinds of support during their campaigns than white male candidates did, for example, from the media or political organizations? And finally, how does what we learn about why women of color and women of men of color run for office the very first time change our perspectives of political theories in general? It seems particularly relevant to talk about this here at St. Anselm, where it's just known for hosting the presidential debates many years. And uh, in this context, it's impossible not to think back to the 2016 election campaign when gender and race were huge factors then and now. Before I begin, I do want to give a bit of backstory. Excuse me. How did the book come about? Well, it was a team effort. My co-authors, Diane Pinderhughes, Christine Sierra, and Peter Lien, and I started meeting about almost 20 years ago now. In 1998, Christine and I wrote a concept paper to present to the Ford Foundation. And we got the grant from them in, 19, in 2003, finished data collection in 2007. Started, I started writing the book in 2009, got to the publisher in 2015. 
It was published finally in 2016, last, this time last year. So I'm so very glad to be here, in part because it's done. <laughs> and also, therefore, it's important to share this story a little bit. It's a short story of perseverance, taking a very long view. It's a lesson for people in politics, even truer now, whether it's striving to gain elected office, to sustain or activate your engagement in politics, or to complete your own research projects. Don't give up. Very important to keep that in mind. Um, why do we write this book? First, I want to tell you, give you a little story. I'm going to read a bit from the, from the, from the, um, the book itself on page 7, the introduction. Uh, let's see now. It's not a book story about um, Obama or Hillary Clinton or presidential politics at all, really. It's really a story about people in, uh, who run at much different levels of office. But... I have to show you this one picture. This is a picture of our team. On the left is me, then there's Martina Davis, who was part of it. You see the person in the middle. Diane Pinderhughes and Paige Lynn and Christine Sieta. And uh, we, were, we were meeting many years, we met all the time, this group across the country. So one time we were in Chicago, the South Side District of Chicago, and thinking, well, maybe we'll get one of the street signs for Obama when he was running in 2004. He was running for the US Senate, okay? So we thought, oh, well, we, well, let me see him. Okay, he's striving, sort of walking down the street. We slam our brakes, jump out of the car, run after him. He goes into a barbershop. So the man, sort of, just the figure behind me, we call him Eddie. I'm not sure if his name was Eddie or not. He said, oh, it's my cousin's barbershop. Oh, he said, well, we want to go inside, but we can't. Saturday night on his, in Chicago, on Saturday night, you don't go into a man's barbershop in Chicago. So, but he said, oh, he's my, my, my cousin, I'll take you in. So he takes us in. So there's Obama sitting there. He strides toward us, and we say, we start babbling on, as women sometimes do. Get very excited what we're doing. Gender Multicultural Leadership Project, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, he looks at us with a, an air of puzzlement. And he says, who are you guys? <laughs> so, in a sense, we wrote, the way we wrote this book was to answer that question, but not about who we are, were as a multicultural group of women scholars, but rather who they are, the women and men who make up the nation's multicultural elected leadership and govern this country, their personal, family, and political backgrounds, why they first ran for office, and their views on and experiences with Amer political leadership and governance and representation in America today. Now, part of the reason it took us so long to complete the book was it was a remarkably complicated task. There was no unified system for collecting information about elected officials. Naleo had one set of data in one format with different variable fields. Black, the Joint Center had others on black, black elected officials different field, everything was coded a little bit differently, different information gathered differently, we didn't know what it was. Asian, we had to look at directories, actually type directories, and there's nothing about American Indian except for um, state legislators, or for non-tribal, I mean, elected officials. So we had to construct the first ever national database made up of more than 10,000 elected officials of color in this country from all across the United States, including black, Latino, and Asian Americans, women and men who are members of Congress, members of Congress, statewide officials, state legislators and local officials, including members of county commissions and boards of supervisors, mayors and members of city governing bodies like city councils, town councils, boards of selectmen, and the members of local elected school boards. It also includes American Indian state legislators as a, because we, the American Indian group said you can't leave us out for, um, for that purpose. So, and if you want to know why we say American Indian instead of Native American, we'll discuss it later because there's a lot of different ways you could say a lot of people's names. So, and then for each elected official in the database, we attach jurisdictional information. We, so to look at the people they represent, we want to be able to compare who the elected officials were compared to who they represent. So in terms of educational attainment, job occupation, poverty levels, um, native and foreign born per percentages, and then a lot of voting characteristics and, and term limits, things like that. So once the database was constructed and the variables were, the data were verified, we carried out a national telephone survey of elected officials of color drawn from the database. Respondents included state legislators and local officials, including county, municipal, and school board members. So our findings from the title of the book is that yes, there has been a transformation in this country, in the American political landscape, um, in terms of growth of elected officials of color. From the top of the power structure from Obama down to local school boards but it's been contested every step of the way, as we can imagine at this point. We are left with a debate, in a sense, after this book and in our lives in general. Has it been a two steps forward, one step back in progress? Or as it might feel today, one step forward and two steps back? But let's start with a positive note of the growth of, uh, of elected officials of color that was brought about by a combination of demographic changes from the, uh, from the 
Immigration Act of 1965 and the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 also. Hmm. Those two acts led to a dramatic increase in the number of people of color in the population, in the electorate, and also in the number of elected officials of color. We saw an exponential rise in the number of people of color holding elected office. In other words, in positions of political leadership. Within just five years, for example, after the passage of the Voting, right Act, Voting Rights Act, black elected officials increased by more than 400%. Went from just a few dozen in 1940 to more than, to more than 10,500 today. Latino elected officials likewise increased by almost 400% since 1970 to more than 6,000 a day. American Indian, American, sorry, Asian Americans also grew exponentially, although the numbers remained small. Now, besides the VRA and the Immigration Act, the other factor that contributes to the growth of elected officials of color in this book we talk about is the role of gender. Women of color have been the force for change in the increased representation by people of color. And without them, women's representation overall would have plateaued at best and declined at worst. Let's go through these two points. First, women of color make up 32% of all elected officials of color. Second, for each racial group, women make up a larger share of their respective racial and ethnic group than do white, white, white women do of white elected officials. Here we see that in 2012, black women made up 37% of black elected officials up from 11% down in 1964. And beside us, who, David Besides, who used to run the Joint Center for Black Studies, um, we, and others have noted that the gains in black elected officials are due to the increasing numbers of black women elected to public office, especially since 1998. We can see sort of the men have plateaued there, and the, the women have continued to rise up, and there's, uh, and that's just, so that the only reason there's more black elected officials now is because of growth in women, okay? Now, the next slide, same thing for, for Latinos. Other than the dip, which I can talk about later if you want, it's really about data collection methods with a Naleo, but the 33.7% compared to 17.8% in 1987. So, 78, sorry, no, 87, that's right. Now, among Asian Americans, see a similar thing, where it's from 12% in 1978 to 32%. Now, so of elected officials, those elected officials of those groups, women consistently represent more. And now in this thing, if you see here, see these are the percent of state women state legislators, and the growth since in the last 20 years. From 1991 to 2013, went from women of color, almost double, more than doubled, and white women, 17% grew, okay? Latinas, 485%. All groups rose almost doubled at least, other than white women who have a paltry 17% growth. That's just in state legislators, okay? Now, one of the reasons we updated the database in 2012 and 2014 was a concern that the data might be getting a little old. But, so we gathered more data that we're updating different levels of office. And we saw in the 2016 election, provide stunning support for the findings that we have in our study. As depressing as it might have been for those of us who wanted to see the woman elected president, and for those of us who were concerned about the progress of women in general in this country, politically, there were some bright spots, including the U.S. Senate. First, if Kamala Harris and Tammy Duckworth had not won their contests, and, and Catherine Cortez Masto had not beaten Joe Heck in Nevada to become the first Latina U.S. Senator, the Senate would have been more Republican, more white, and more male. Instead of just one woman senator, U.S. senator, now, who, uh, before, who was Maisie Hirano, now there were four, which is not great, but still four women of color. Then women now make up half of all the people in the, of women of color in the Senate. So there were four men plus Maisie. Now there's four men and four women, okay? Not a lot, but still something. And as Democrats, they make a party, provide a party counterpoint to the Republican men of color contingent. So it's odd because in the U.S. Senate you have Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and, and uh, Tim Scott, who are all Republicans, who are people of color who don't tend to vote Republican, and yet they're three out of the four. The only other ma male of color was Cory Booker, who was a Democrat. 75% of the um, men in the Senate are, of color are Republicans, which is nuts. I'm sorry, for, in terms of representing people, who they represent. 
And yet, now that you have women, you've got four women now, and four men, or five, and one man, so I guess five to four, three now, instead of, what was, three to four, Republican to um, uh, Democrat. And this gives voice to social justice issues otherwise ignored, all right? Second, they take office at a time when white women have lost seats or stayed the same. So for example, out of 14 seats, races in which white women ran for the U.S. Senate, two incumbents won, Patty Murray and Lisa Murkowski. The media, of course, focus also on the third race, which is Maggie Hassan versus Kelly Ayotte, right? Everybody, oh, is Maggie gonna win? Was dragged it out, oh, it's amazing, she won, great. Of the other, they, that hides the fact, however, that of the other white women, 11 white women who ran, they all lost. Every other white woman lost. The only women that won really were these three women of color, Kamala Harris, Tammy Duckworth, and um, Catherine Master Cortez. So in fact, if it had not been women of color, number of, the numbers of women in general in Congress and state legislators also would have gone down. So actually the women, women in state legislators was like 25%, and so some of the more women of color went one than two, it would have been gone down if it hadn't been for them in the U.S. Senate, in the, in the state legislators, legislatures. So the rest of what I'm gonna talk about today answers in part what Obama asked us back in 2004. Who are these guys and women holding elected office in the United States? First, we documented about three quarters, and we've been talking about the Senate, we've been talking about the President, right? Members of Congress. We documented about three quarters of elected officials of, of color hold local elected offices. So it's mayors, city and town councilors, county commissioners, local school board members. At first that surprised me, we thought, oh my goodness, why do people of color run for such low level offices? Turns out 96% of all elected officials in this country, of which are more than 500,000, are held by local officials. Turns out in Vermont, there's even a dog, the dog catcher's even elected, okay? So, um, so I'm just saying that this is important because it's often overlooked that there's most, 96% of all elected officials in this country are at the local level. Why do people study more Congress and presidency and state government, statewide officials? Because it's easier. You can, there's, everybody knows things. They know where they find them. They're smaller in numbers. You can study the, you know, all these groups um, collect data. They're reported easily. It's very hard to even find out who people are in these local officials. The last time there was a U.S. Census of city, town gov of um, local officials was in 1992. They've never reported another time. They, they keep track of how many positions there are, but they don't collect any data about them. There's never been a census again about who are the local officials in this country. So, since 1992, that's a very important thing. So, second, my favorite set of findings from the study is hearing from them, in their own words, why they ran for office the very first time. Let's start by putting to rest the notion that, quote, women need to be asked to run. How many of you heard this? I'm sure people in the new leadership program say that all the time, right? Activists and researchers often say research shows that women need to be asked. They need to be asked three times, four times, six times. Now it's up to eight. I've heard one quote, they need to be asked eight times. They say research shows that. Turns out it's not true. It's not true. There's no research that shows that. In fact, no matter how many times you a activists repeat it, it's largely based on anecdotes and studies with limited generalizability and assumptions that men in general, like white men, are more likely to be self-starters in politics. And it's not true, not just because our data doesn't support it, but because I went to the original sources if you ask Barbara Lee, the philanthropist and writer of, of political things, um, you know, where, where, did they, where did they get the data? So, well, research show, they'll say, people will say, well, I got it from Barbara Lee's office. And then they'll say, well, they got it from Jennifer Lawless. Everybody knows Jennifer Lawless in politics, a big researcher on these things. She says, no, I never said that. We never said that. There is no data that support, there are no data that support that women need to be asked to run. They admitted that people eager to find a solution to women's relatively low levels of office holding have extrapolated from the question, women report they were not asked to run, which is true. Women are not asked to run, but men aren't often either. either. Um, but they extrapolate from the idea that women say they didn't, weren't asked to run to, well, women won't run, won't run unless they're asked. And that's, that's a false, a false leap of fate, a leap of understanding. And the reason we don't have enough women is they need to be asked. So if we ask women, they'll run because they weren't asked and therefore and there aren't very many of them in office, which is crazy when you think about it. It's not, it's not a legitimate way of doing science to say you leap from one thing to the other. And I was, myself am guilty of assuming it was true. In 2003, I stood up at the end of the New England Women's Political Summit and said, women need to be asked to run. Consider yourselves asked. Dumb. And I did ask one person, Nikki Song, because she said, yes, she ran because I asked her, but that's not really true either. <laughs> but and that's an anecdote. It's an anecdote. Okay, my anecdote says, yes, it's true. It's not true. But repeating something over and over again does not make it true. 
So the response in our survey did not report being recruited by parties or any other thing, or even encouraged to run. What were the reasons they did give? To get the answer, we asked them three open-ended questions. Tell us in your own words why you ran for office the first time. So what did they say? This slide shows a typology of motivations to run for office. You see at the top, a community, 50% said they ran for reasons that had something to do with community. 50% said they ran for reasons to do with issue passion. Representation, 29%, make a change, make a difference, 21%. Personal reasons, ambition, 21%. Strategic considerations, like I wanted to, I thought that I could win or there's an open seat. Opportunity, 15%. Encourage recruited, 16%, and political interest, 11%. Now, we coded the, what they said, ver, ver, they said verbatim, we, we wrote down what they said verbatim and then um, coded from them into non-mutually exclusive um, uh, categories, which means people could say more than one. Obviously, it wasn't that they necessarily <clears throat> had to only pick one. The motivations range from a very concrete issue, such as the Latino male city council member in Wyoming who replied, quote, I always wanted to build a, vi build a di viaduct. I wanted to build a viaduct. We need a viaduct. Quote, there was a no toilet in the park, end of quote. Quote from a Latino mayor in California. And an alderman in Mississippi responded, quote, my main reason to one run was street improvement, end of quote. An Asian American male state senator from Hawaii said, for example, that he ran, quote, to help small businesses. And a Latino male county commissioner in Colorado responded, quote, lots of crime, not a lot for kids to do. Crime was out of line for the size of the town. I thought if I could help with that, area of the community it would be a plus, end of quote. And a Latina school board member from California said, quote, getting more AP classes so students could go further in life. Okay. Now the half of who ran for a reason related to community said something like, I wanted to serve my community. And they, this example would say combine public, the idea of public service and community. But community can also refer to a geographic area, a group of people such as the black community, the LGBT community. Or even more appealing way of explaining the pursuit of office, quote, I was asked by my community, end of quote. A lot of people would say that. I was asked my community my, when they said they were encouraged by somebody. Say, my, my, my community wanted me to run. Another example, a male, black male municipal official responded with, quote, due to the way I was raised, the chance I had to get where I am to develop myself into a better person in the community where I live. In this case, community conveys a location, but not necessarily a focus on benefiting this community as a reason to, to run. Now, in looking back at the difficulties we had in trying to tease out the many meanings of community, I felt like paraphrasing the current president. Who knew that community could be so complicated? <laughs> okay. Sometimes there is a connection to community even when the word isn't used. And sometimes people throw community, the word community around when they don't really mean anything by it. They'll say, oh, the community wanted me to this, or the community asked me this. But who are they, who are they really talking about? Well, we, we, we wanted to have community mean something like the embeddedness in a community because that was what our hypothesis was, that women of color would be more embedded in the community, more have run for a reason that more connected to their community uh, strengths in their community, the relationship in the community. But it was very hard with these answers, the verbatim to really understand what community meant to people without having a follow-up. So the disadvantage of quali quantitative research, you can't really follow up with each individual. What, what do you mean when you said that, you know? Now, an Asian American male state legislator from Maryland said, when asked why he ran for office the first time, demonstrated a community-based reason when he said, first, there were open seats, which is really a strategic consideration, but all followed by, I wanted to serve my community. Now, we don't, again, we don't know whether he meant the Asian community, his neighborhood, we don't know if the municipal official, we don't know what he meant. But um, in that case, he did want to serve his community. A Latino male state legislature from a large city in New Mexico who said, to serve my state, my community, and my people. Service, including a community focus, clearly motivated many who often said they ran because they wanted or feel the need, felt the need to, quote, give back to the community, end quote, however they define community. Among the other motivations, in the slide here, almost a third said they ran to increase minority and or female representation, and a smaller percentage, 15%, gave strategic reasons. Quote, there were open seats, end of quote, or I thought I could win, end of quote. Little evidence, however, of what we call naked personal ambition. Just 3% gave a reason that we coded as saying something about ambition. Like sort of, I wanted to run because I wanted, I wanted to be somebody. In my earlier research, there people said, I ran because I had ego. I wanted to be somebody. That was pretty clear. I wanted to run for me. That would be considered, in, this, this was not very, as clear, clear cut. But a black male official in Louisiana, for example, responded, he was from the county official, 
Quote, personal ambition, end of quote. It's pretty straightforward. Answered our question pretty clearly. We didn't offer, the, offer that as a choice. He just said that's why, that's why he ran. But it was his second response, after coming after his concern for local improvement, end of quote. His third was very general, but on the altruistic side as well. Quote, being serviceable, service to mankind. So it's unclear there whether they were hiding this personal ambition behind these more things you thought we wanted to hear. Service to the community sounds like a good thing to do, as opposed to I wanted to run because I wanted to be somebody. Um, in fact, when I did the study back, and I think it was, it was a study I didn't actually ever publish. Um, it's available online, but it's not published. And uh, a man who said, uh, why'd you run an ego? And then he quietly said, well, I don't think this, I should add something to that because it doesn't sound so good, right? So that was the kind of thing that men might say or people might say. Um, that they might think it's not a good thing to say I wanted to run because I'm ambitious. But since our, in and then, since our interest lies at the intersection of gender and race, we were struck by the fact that for elected officials of color, there's a remarkable consensus across race and gender for most motiv motivations to run for office. Very, very few significant differences between genders and race on any of these variables. Um, either race and gender separately or the black women versus black men, Latino men, women versus Latina men. As important as this consensus is to expanding our political knowledge base, as researchers, we struggled with the lack of significant differences by race and gender. It was a big, it was a big part of our, our hypothesis was, you know, women of color are going to be more focused on community. That's my first research. I, that's my first study, the one, the book you like. It's, that was what it said. It said women are more community focused. Men like to be in positions of authority and they want to win, you know. So, um, they turn on the computers, computers and print out their lists of, of, of accomplishments and positions they held. That was my favorite story from that book. But it turns out that qualitative research, including my own, showed, that showed clear differences on how Latinos, in that case, viewed politics, with men more interested in personal advancement, including the positions they held, whereas Latinos voiced more of a community focus and wanted to make a change. Obviously, that's, that I have that at heart. We all believe that that was true. And a lot of work had been built on that. I think a lot of research had been done on that, thinking it's also built a little bit on this idea that women make, are better at making relationships. So if that's the white women's political research. Is women make relationships, therefore, but if Latinas talk more about being community-oriented, then maybe that's because they're women. So it was a little, but because of this prior work, and a central hypothesis was that women of color would be more likely than men of color to run for community-focused reasons, whereas motivations for men of color would be more strategic and demonstrate more personal ambition, the bottom line is that Quantitative study reveals no gender difference within or between women of color and men of color. In fact, we I did multivariate analysis, which I kind of blurred out some of the ones that weren't significant. But if you look at the top, and this is only part of the whole table, but the top, the highlighted ones show that men, Latino men, Asian men, and American Indian men were slightly, they were significantly more likely than black females to say community was a, to be coded, saying community was a reason they ran. That was a little shocking to us. We were, what are we going to do with this part? Okay, we can, uh, but then we thought, okay, why would, might this be true? The gender uh, analysis race similarities across the board, basically, in the book, we talk about how there are a lot more similarities and differences in between men of color and women of color, anyhow, in many of the aspects. There's more power of the racial dynamic than one might expect. The gender differences aren't as huge as you think in many of the cases, even when they're significant. So to this, that, but we could say, okay, one possible explanation for the relatively modest gender race difference on community is a reason to run. We could have coded it, coded it wrong. We just got it wrong. We got it wrong. Could code it wrong. We tried many, we had many different people coding and, and trying to do consistent coding methods. We had different rules for what it meant to be community. We did different ways. For example, if you counted the word community versus not using the word community and whether it was a community-based um, co uh, coded or not. So we could have made a mistake. The second could be the limitation. It shows the limitations and biases of qualitative studies, including mine in the past. Maybe qualitative studies aren't so good. On the other hand, quantitative studies also could be, could be flawed because of the coding or other reasons. And that women in politics literature got it wrong because by saying that women are more relational than men, and I bought, got into that a little bit with the Latinas and we asked questions, maybe, and maybe, I'm not sure what, we interviewed activists as much as we did elected officials in my study originally, so maybe it was more, when, once they're elected officials, it's not gonna be as, as extreme, the difference. Political tra trajectories for people of color, the linked fate overshadowed gender, number four. And number five is, it's like I say, that study that I didn't publish was that differences in political discourse 
may obscure commonalities. In other words, I hinted in 1997 that men may talk about positions and less about interpersonal aspects of politics, and yet in their daily lives they may go out and do stuff with the community more than we, they, they may not say I'm being related to my community or being relational, but if they go out every day to go talk to people on the, on the, in the neighborhoods and try to help people get things done, maybe they also is just as interested in community based, they just talk about it differently. They think, they think politics is supposed to be about positions. Maybe that's why they're talking about it more than, so when you actually ask them why they run, it comes out this way. Finally, the gender and race finding pales in comparison to the highly significant contribution in the multivariate model, which, going backwards, oh, the level of office makes a difference. Obviously, every level other than municipal officials who are most connected, they're running, they run because they are connected to a neighborhood, a community, their, their town or their, their city that is a community for them. So maybe the fact that so many people in our study are municipal officials or local officials, that the most significant difference is that state legislators, school board members, and even county are less likely to predict, to say they vote for a reason that was community-based than municipal officials. So maybe that's more important. Okay. Now, so let's consider this an unsolved mystery, you know, and it's one ripe for research attention. So if people are interested in more pursuing this, I think it's a very valid thing. We've been talking about women being more relational in, in every aspect of politics, and then, then our research we've done before, and then now there's questions about whether it's really valid. So let's move on though, to other topics for today, which had to do with patterns of office holding prior to running. Our findings in this area also challenge another firmly held assumption about women in politics literature, that there's a political pipeline and that if women would follow the path laid out by men, they too can gain access to elected office. We've all heard it, right? Women need to build the farm team. We've got to build the farm team. If we build the farm team, it'll be all fine. Um, they'll start in local office, gain experience, and slowly, gradually move up to higher level office. Well, what did we find? Elected officials of color, okay, let's see. Let's see what I'll do first. Are, whoops, that's not right. Hmm. Oh, here it is. Elected officials of color are, in general, self-starters. They have non-linear paths to office. They can be run for state legislator, then for a local office. They might run to Congress first, then go to state legislative office. You can go back and forth between different offices. We have different examples in the book of that. Um, the evidence of a career ladder for elected officials of color is slim. Just two started at a local level. There, see. 78% or 79% started, were in their first elected position. They didn't jump from somewhere else first. Uh, the vast majority ha having held no prior office at all. Women of color in Congress are less likely than their male counterparts to start at the local level. And more than half of state legislators of color were elected directly into a legislative seat without first holding lo low level office or, part, or, or even not an elected office. We asked about whether they'd been in a, in a appointed position too. So anything below a the current office was considered a um, lower level, level position. Most of them had not. Now, as, and again, I must admit this is unclear whether this is because of a lack of progressive ambition, ambition, lack of a career ladder, or is it that there is, that the idea of a pipeline to higher office is a myth, especially for people of color, that, that there are many paths to office for people of color and that the evidence of a discrete ambition, meaning that they ran, they were in one seat, and they, some of them had been in the same seat for 10 years or more. They'd been in the seat for many, they re ran for re-election, so it's not like they went in the seat and they just stayed there forever because they could. They had to re run for re-election, so that's a discrete ambition. And there's progressive ambition. Um, now, is this, is this a sign of high satisfaction with being a school board member or a county official, or is it a low progressive ambition? They don't really want to hire office. Or like Hillary Clinton's seemingly unbreakable glass ceiling, they face instead a cement ceiling solidified by resistance ba based on race and gender together. Because we didn't really know whether they had run, f well, they were re-elected to the same seat. We didn't know if they had tried to run for another office and failed. So it could be in a one seat that have tried to run for the legislature or a county official and they didn't make it. So we don't know that from these, this group of people. But at the time of the survey, the mean scores for women were lower than for men on likelihood of running for higher level office. So we asked the question, do you plan on running for higher level office in the future? So, but the mean score was lower for women than it was for men. But during the follow-up, we, we actually went down and looked for, had they run for higher office? 
and for all different levels, members of Congress, not from state legislators, and down to lower um, municipal officials and county officials. We tracked sub subsequent runs in the seven years since they were surveyed and found that 35% of women and 27.8% of men had actually run for a higher office. So even though a woman said, no, I'm not gonna run higher, I'm happy where I am, I'm not running, they said no on a scale of zero to 10, and they weren't gonna run, and yet 35% of women ran, and a little over a quarter of men did. So that's an interesting concept, I think, that, that, that maybe that's not what people say they're gonna do, and what they do may be different. Now, Again, I have to say it's complicated, obviously. Now, in this, one of the other things I was supposed to talk about here, I'm running out of time, I know, but I wanted to leave you with some tidbits of what I had said I would discuss. To what extent are women of color more disadvantaged than their male counterparts during their election campaigns? A lot of it's been made in political science about the double disadvantage for women of color by gender and race, right? That women are they doubly disadvantaged in, in education, occupation, everything. And then in politics, too, theoretically. But in this following slide, if you look, the far two columns on the right, especially that last two on the very bottom right there, where it says that women, the, the mean index of perceived campaign disadvantage was 2.17% 2.17 out of, out of a uh, 0 to 10 scale, 2.28% or 2.28 as a mean for men of color, but it's significant, statistically significant, quite a bit, but P, uh, my P less than 0 0.01. Now, that means that if you see all the shading on the women and men on their all, that men consistently saw themselves as more disadvantaged in running when they're during the election campaign. They, they felt that in all, and if you look at what they were disadvantaged for, uh, less, less than support for parties, it's kind of large, but it wasn't very statistically significant, 41.9 to 34.6, but Less support from other political organizations, 10 percentage point difference almost, uh, greater scrutiny on qualifications, significant, hard time raising money. They, uh, as a whole, not, that was not statistically significant, but um, for black men, look at there, 45 percent, 9.9 percent for, of men, 38 percent for women. Um, they keep going down. The greatest scrutiny on family back, and you think that's going to be, women are going to feel concerned about the greatest scrutiny, right? Turns out that and media even, that um, and the scrutiny on personal appearance, that men consistently felt they had faced more scrutiny on the family background and the media, and um, then and even the men, uh, black men, on personal appearance, 20%, 20 percent, 10 percent uh, difference there, 10 percentage point difference. So men of color in general, as a group, and black men in particularly, group report a higher incidence of feeling marginalized and discriminated on the campaign trail than women, do women of color as a group. These include comments on personal appearance, raising money, and, the, and scrutiny on family background. The columns for black men show this especially true for them, and also for the on family background was consistent across all the male, male groups. Now, why might this be true? Now, remember, first of all, we're talking about winners. Remember, these are people who are elected. These are not people who are, can we're not talking about, it's not a study of candidates, it's a study of people who got elected. So maybe they're the winners. They, winners are different than the people who ran and lost. Um, but some have theorized that because the double disadvantage women of color face in the population, women of color have to work harder and be more qualified to succeed politically and professionally so that they come into this as candidates having achieved more, therefore they're not as, as disadvantaged in their personal lives. So when they get into the campaign, they may, not feel that they're as scrutinized or as problem, or maybe they're just used to it and so it doesn't really matter as much, but or they don't report as being particularly problematic. But while these findings seem counterintuitive, they make some sense because as I show in chapter three, for this group of elected officials in general, black and Latino women elected officials were significantly less disadvantaged in education and occupation than their male counterparts, although more in terms of current household income and marriage rates. Okay, men of color tend to be much more likely to be married than women of color elected officials especially black and Latina. There are like large percentages difference there. But so if they're, um, so we found the bottom line is you need to look at gender with an open mind because if they, black men really are, come from families that are more disadvantaged, it's not that nuts to think that they're gonna go into these election campaigns and find themselves facing some of the same disadvantages they felt, either it's their feelings or it's reality for them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. In conclusion, I was supposed to leave with how does what we learn about why women of color 
and women and men of color run for office and how their patterns of office holding change our perspectives on political theories. Well, we challenge key tenets of political theories on which the women in politics literature in particular is based. First, is it legitimate to put women of color at the center of a research study? We didn't interview white women, we didn't interview white men. Um, and by, not as a comparison to them, white men or women. And we had a lot of discussion about that. We, in San Francisco, Davis, we spent a lot of places. We, we discussed, should we have white women? But it's gonna be, then it'll be women compared to white people. That didn't seem right. So women of color should be centered. And thoroughly investigating the data through an intersectional lens contributed to political science writ large. Second, asking women to run for office while admirable and even valuable on occasion is not gonna solve the problem of women's underrepresentation in elected office. It's not. So let's put that one to bed. I'll go out and say, it doesn't work. Let's find another reason, to how, another way of getting women involved in politics um, or, or succeed in getting women more elected, um, more women elected. Third, we raise questions about the relevance of the double disadvantage notion with findings that among the elites, at least, the elected officials, men of color may come to office with backgrounds, from backgrounds of greater disadvantage than their female counterparts and thus feel they face more discrimination during their election campaigns or they actually may be more disadvantaged. We've talked about the, the issues of the cr cr criminal justice system. You know, right now we talk about you know, Ferguson and all the different things that happen with black men in this country, for example, and people of color in this country. It would not make sense. There would be some sense that maybe they really are having facing more disadvantage. We, when we think of intersectional analysis, we cannot just say it's about women being, having problems. We need to raise them up. It's really about looking at gender in a real meaningful way within race. Fourth, since 96% of all elected officials serve at the local level, we do need to support more research in this area. But make no mistake, after careful analysis, we realize there's no pipeline for women. So let's leave the plumbing metaphor as well as the baseball metaphor of a, quote, farm team, end of quote, where they belong, out in left field. Thank you. Thank you.